Okay, so uh, again, uh, thanks uh, for the invitation to uh, speak here. Um, my name is Hot Finkelstein. I'm a Chief R&D Officer uh, at AI uh, and a LiDAR company. And uh, I will be speaking about artificial intelligence with advanced photonic boost, high resolution, uh, 3D vision up to a kilometer away. Um, so um, uh, in terms of uh, the structure of my talk, uh, I'll uh, start with the very basic fundamentals of how LiDAR actually works. Uh, then uh, I will move on to discuss uh, some of the uh, main uh, system architectures uh, for, uh, for LiDAR. Um, and uh, then I will uh, discuss in some more detail uh, AI's adaptive sensing uh, using deterministic artificial intelligence, which is the unique approach uh, that, uh, that uh, we are taking uh, to address this uh, very tough challenge of uh, automotive uh, LiDAR. And I will conclude my talk uh, with some performance videos uh, to show how the system actually operates uh, in uh, real life uh, conditions. So uh, first of all, how, do, how does the LiDAR work? So uh, LiDAR measures the time of flight of light um, in order to provide the position and reflectivity uh, of objects. So uh, basically all, all LiDAR systems have an emitter that you can see here, a, a receiver, and uh, they send some form of light, whether it's pulse light or CW or uh, amplitude modulated or frequency modulated light, and uh, the system measures uh, the time it takes that light uh, to travel uh, to the detector and back, and sometimes uh, additional information, such as the intensity of the echo, the Doppler shift, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, typically when uh, we uh, look at, you know, how well a LiDAR system uh, actually performs, uh, at, at least in the automotive field, automotive OEMs typically specify performance for a 10% reflective Lambertian target, Clearly, a more, a more reflective target, you can see it much farther away. Um, the, the, the performance must be in bright sunlight, and specifically at 100 kilolux of uh, sunlight. Um, equally important is what is the probability of detection. So if there is a target and you uh, try to image it n times, how, what percentage of those times are you actually going to detect it? And then what is the, the false alarm rate? Um, so again, uh, all of these are knobs that can be played and really the relevance of a specification of a LiDAR system is only when all of these uh, uh, specifications uh, are defined uh, concurrently. Now, um, next I wanna uh, go over some of the main uh, LiDAR architectures uh, out there. And the first one, uh, I call them the spinners. Uh, these are uh, more formally known as the rotating uh, LIDARs, and I'm sure you, a lot of you have, uh, have seen them. And these were really the first ones to be demonstrated in the market. Uh, they were actually invented, I would say, uh, by students in the DARPA challenge in the 2000s, uh, really using off-the-shelf components. So they took some uh, lasers, they took some detectors, uh, they built some uh, mechanics, um, and basically they started spinning those uh, devices around. You can see a picture um, uh, on the top right uh, from the DARPA challenge in 2007. Uh, these systems are still uh, you know, quite popular today. If you look at systems today, they look not very different from the 2007 systems. Uh, these LiDAR systems typically cover 360 degrees, which is good, but sometimes you know, if you want to uh, mount uh, the LiDAR in the front of the car or on the side of the car, you don't really need 360 degrees. Uh, one of the main challenges is that they trade off range for frame rate because uh, you have to wait for the echo to return from the farthest target before you move on to the next position and you're continuously rotating. The vertical resolution is achieved by packing more lasers in the rotating head shown below. And that means that the system is not really very much scalable, very scalable in terms of its uh, resolution because there are only so many lasers you can pack in the laser head. And uh, these uh, systems typically suffer from relatively low reliability uh, and it's really the mechanical gears that typically are first to fail and they're also susceptible to vibration and shock. So uh, some of the newer systems are uh, what I call uh, the gazers. Um, they are also formerly known as flash, uh, flash lidars. And uh, those systems simultaneously illuminate and image the whole field of view. Uh, there are actually very few uh, real flash lidar systems out there in the market today in fact, the only one that I'm aware of that is true flash is the Continental uh, LiDAR system. 
the other ones call themselves flash, but uh, they uh, play games by uh, sequentially acquiring a, a signal. So uh, while those systems have no moving parts, uh, they do suffer from three fatal flaws. Uh, the first one is that they illuminate the whole field of view um, uh, basically with almost uniform power. And that power is defined by the dimmest, farthest object that the system needs to see. And therefore, these systems waste a huge amount of power because obviously you're not going to have the dimmest, farthest object in the brightest sunlight everywhere in your field of view. And yet you illuminate with that, uh, with that maximum power. They also image a relatively uh, large field of view with fine resolution, so they require very expensive optics and large detector arrays. And uh, probably most critically is because they illuminate and, and image a very high dynamic range scene at once, both a car tire and a retroreflector, for example, they are susceptible to stray light. And we can see that uh, in the images uh, below, where you can see a license plate, and because that license plate is reflecting a lot of the laser light, uh, you have blooming or haloing effects, and uh, those can uh, be even worse in, in uh, more challenging conditions. So gazers really offer a very simple architecture, a solid state, no moving parts, but uh, they would typically uh, come with an inferior cost and with higher power consumption and a lar larger size. That brings us to the more um, uh, prevalent architectures out there today, which are the scanning mirrors. And there are two types of uh, those systems. The first one uh, is called a monostatic architecture. And basically the way that these systems operate is shown on the diagram on the right. Uh, you have an emitter, uh, the, which is a laser. Uh, the laser light is reflected through a mirror to an object. The object reflects the light uh, to many directions. Some of that light returns back to the same mirror and from that mirror, uh, the light is funneled to a detector. Um, and it's really the fact that you're using the same mirror that is important here. Um, now, one of the biggest challenges of these systems is that uh, collecting enough signal requires a large aperture. But uh, in order to uh, uh, basically uh, conserve a tandu, you need to have a large mirror to do the collection. However, mechanically, um, um, because you need to stop and scan at every position out of you know, maybe 100,000 positions, uh, directions that the LiDAR has to point to, uh, making a large mirror means that the system is not stable mechanically. And so there are these conflicting uh, requirements for monostatic systems, which makes them either large uh, and expensive or drawing uh, a lot of power uh, so that you can achieve uh, the, uh, the target signal to noise ratio. Uh, the other challenge uh, uh, happens with a nearby uh, obstacle, such as a windshield. So uh, some of the emitter light is going to be reflected by those nearby uh, um, obstacles and be uh, sent back to the detector, uh, sometimes overwhelming it. And therefore, uh, for these systems, you typically need to mount them uh, on the roof of a car. And that is, uh, in some applications, uh, undesirable. So monostatic systems have a limited cost and size scalability, and they suffer from uh, back reflection. Um, the, the last uh, architecture that I'm going to, uh, to describe uh, is also a scanning mirror architecture, but it's called a bi-static architecture or a coaxial architecture. Uh, in this architecture, uh, we have an emitter, and um, uh, the laser light is reflected again from a scanning mirror uh, to map the whole field of view, but the reflected signal is collected through a collection lens, which focuses the light onto a detector. Uh, the benefit of this architecture is that there is no need to wait for an echo before the, me the beam uh, moves to the next position. And that means you can uh, basically have multiple pulses in the air uh, at any uh, one time, and that translates to more 3D points per second, higher resolution, higher performance of the system, and, um, and this also enables more flexibility in the scan patterns. You can basically tell the detector where you want to, uh, tell the LiDAR system where you want to fire, and you can uh, send it back to a position uh, where uh, there, are, there is inf interesting information. And I will discuss that in my next slide. Um, one of the nice features of uh, this uh, architecture is because you don't need to scan and stop, scan and stop, the mirrors can be very small. You also don't use the same mirror for the collection path. So you can have a larger lens 
uh, to collect enough of the signals so that your uh, uh, emitter power is low um, and also have a, a, a smaller uh, mirror. So you're basically uh, having the cake and, and eating it too. Um, now, uh, the physical separation between the emitter and the receiver um, can also provide immunity to near field uh, reflections, uh, such as I mentioned before, uh, from a windshield or from dirt on, on the target. And uh, consequently, these systems are uh, quite small. This is uh, a, an image of a system by Continental uh, using uh, AIs uh, by static technology. And these systems can be integrated uh, on the roof, but also inside the grill or even inside uh, uh, cabins of, uh, of vehicles. Now, uh, that really brings us to the need for uh, uh, intelligence in scanning. So, um, Imaging at the highest resolution everywhere wastes system resources, and that means um, laser power, or otherwise it undersamples the scene, which is also not so good. So this is akin to uh, you know, a sprinkler system that just uh, sprinkles everywhere. You would, you would water the grass where you need the water, but you'd also waste water on the pavement. Uh, think of intelligence in a LiDAR system, like the smart sprinkler system on the right, where you only uh, water where uh, this is needed. And uh, really the uh, programmability of the system uh, is done in software. Um, and so you can uh, reprogram uh, the uh, scan pattern uh, adaptively or uh, based on uh, the information uh, that is found in your scene. Okay. Now, scene adaptation can be quite tough. Uh, there are a lot of different scenes that an automotive LiDAR system needs to look at. There are some unpredictable objects like, uh, you know, crazy motorcyclists trying to cut you off or a kid uh, running uh, after a ball, uh, or you need to operate in adverse weather conditions. Each one of them uh, translates to different scanning uh, requirements from the LiDAR system. So it is uh, quite desirable uh, to have an adaptive uh, scanning scheme. So what uh, we do at AI is we initially uh, map out the whole uh, field of view uh, with quite good resolution. And that resolution itself can be programmed such that in the center of the field of view, you achieve high resolution by firing the laser quite densely, whereas in the background, um, you fire uh, more sparsely. But once we find interesting objects, we can go back within the frame. So within milliseconds, we can go back to those positions and map out those uh, interesting uh, objects at much higher resolution, giving, giving higher reliability and higher confidence in the classification of these objects. And we call that search, which is the first uh, uh, phase, acquire. And then we move that information to the uh, fusion engine uh, to, uh, of, of the automotive uh, vehicle to act based on uh, the information that has been collected. So search, acquire, and act. Uh, next, I'm going to show you uh, some videos of how our system actually operates. So we take these systems out to the field. Uh, we use uh, sprinklers uh, to uh, generate uh, mist. We image through a window uh, to mimic uh, internal uh, imaging. And what you can see here is the water cloud in the beginning. And now we can see uh, objects that are being mapped by the system all the way to 1,000 meters. So I'll, I'll just show it uh, one more time. So again, there is a, a sprinkler system that mimics uh, the uh, uh, mist, uh, then a window that mimics the windshield of the car, and you can see the uh, mist cloud, and then all of the objects that are mapped, and this is done in full sunlight, uh, all the way to 1,000 meters, and we're getting tens of points uh, per uh, vehicle uh, um, at, uh, at, at maximum distance. Another example is uh, imaging when the sun is right inside the field of view, which is actually very difficult in terms of uh, stray light and other effects. And what we can see here is that even though the sun is directly in the uh, uh, field of view uh, of the system, we can see the vehicles, we can see the uh, trees and the bushes uh, to hundreds of meters in uh, range. And um, Another application uh, for a LiDAR system is in intelligent transportation. Uh, in this example, this is automated tolling uh, to be able to uh, map out uh, cars, objects, other vehicles as they approach a toll gate, again, across uh, uh, various um, um, uh, weather conditions and uh, different vehicles, uh, et cetera. 
So uh, to uh, summarize uh, my talk, uh, LiDAR, LiDAR sensors uh, have to deliver reliable data across very challenging conditions in a small form factor uh, using low power and uh, with a low cost manufacturable product. So this is a very, very challenging uh, problem that very few companies in the world have been able to, uh, to address uh, as of today. Now, various architectures try to address this, chal this challenge, but the problem with all of them is that they deploy very expensive system resources independently of the scene. And this results in, ex in either expensive products or underperforming ones. What uh, we do at AI is we intelligently invest those system resources um, where information exists in order to provide actionable 3D point clouds. So in order to ensure um, um, the, the safety of the system, we map out the whole field of view. But then in order to increase uh, the reliability and resolution, we go back to the regions uh, that contain the most interesting information and map them out in even greater detail. Um, our biostatic design enables software-controlled uh, deterministic scanning algorithms in a mechanically robust and cost-efficient system. And uh, today, the system is being deployed in automotive, smart infrastructure, and in industrial applications. And um, with that, uh, I, will, uh, I, I will end my talk and open it for questions. I want to just thank one of our fans that sent, sent us <laughs> this nice uh, AI uh, anime object. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'll open this uh, session for uh, questions.